And so it's our great pleasure this evening to introduce you to Andreas Vasmort, who is going to be talking to us on the genius of Immanuel Kant and his ethics. Andreas um, is a philosopher and he is also the chair of the BRLSI programme and the convener of the philosophy group at the BRLSI and also of the economics and business group. Um, so with, and he's also German by birth. <laughs> so uh, without any further ado, I shall hand over to him and we look forward to hearing what you have to say, Andreas, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Lisa. That's been a very kind introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here again today talking to the uh, German language and, and culture group. I think it's been about three years ago since I was last uh, with you giving a talk on a very difficult philosopher called uh, Hegel. In fact, uh, the three most difficult philosophers in terms of in either language, English or in German, uh, are commonly known by, as uh, Kant, number, number one, Hegel, number two, and Heidegger, number three. So after tonight, I will have completed numbers one and two, and maybe I'll come back at another time uh, to complete the trio with a talk on Martin Heidegger. Uh, but before we get on to that, uh, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here, and uh, I'm looking forward to trying to to make sense myself of the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. Um, today is quite an auspicious day, really, because uh, today is uh, uh, would have been uh, Immanuel Kant's 297th birthday. So he was actually born on the 22nd of April. And it is also World Earth Day today, which is quite relevant because uh, part of Kant's philosophy actually was the development of an idea of two worlds, the phenomenal world and the noumenal world. And I come to explain that a little bit uh, later on as part of the presentation. But in terms of what I'm going to be covering today, uh, I want to cover very briefly Immanuel Kant's life uh, in on one slide, which is uh, going to be interesting. I want to provide a little bit of historic context in terms of uh, Kant and how he was positioned. Uh, I'll then go from the historical context to the philosophical context in terms of what was the milieu in which he found himself in uh, uh, from a philosophical perspective. Uh, I then uh, expound on a few of his key philosophical ideas and then we'll finish off uh, with the legacy that he left uh, for philosophy in general. So away we go. Um, right, his life in a very basic outline. I mentioned he was born on the 22nd of April, 1724 in Königsberg, which was the, which is now Kaliningrad in Russia, but used to be the capital of East Prussia. And uh, I come on to talk about some of the more historical context uh, in a bit. Uh, he was quite young, as you can see, uh, he was only 13 when his mother died. Uh, and uh, he described his mother in later life as a wholly uneducated woman with a great degree of natural intelligence. And uh, I think subsequent commentators on Kant highlight that uh, uh, his mother had a significant uh, impact on his uh, moral upbringing. Uh, his father was a harness maker, so from quite uh, sort of low beginnings, and he sort of rose to university at a later stage. Uh, the, the main thing to really highlight is that uh, this, the family was uh, part of the sort of pietist movement, and, and, and Emmanuel was one of seven children. He also had uh, five uh, sisters and a brother. Uh, later on in life, uh, although all of his sisters remained in Königsberg, he never saw any of them. He contributed financially to them throughout his life, but he never actually met them. And that's quite interesting because Königsberg, even in those days, was probably only a city of uh, some 60,000 uh, population. So no bigger really, or actually smaller than Bath today. Anyway, uh, at the age of 17, he enrolls at the University of Königsberg. Uh, uh, to take his, do his degree. And as you know, uh, 
in Germany, degrees can take significantly longer than in the UK. So this is normally a, an endeavor for up to a decade. Now, halfway through, his father dies and uh, uh, leaves the family penniless, which means he actually has to leave uh, university and become a, a private tutor, including to the uh, tutors to the family Kaiserling, the Count and Countess of Kaiserling who in later life, in the 20th century, are going to produce a sort of pseudo-philosopher uh, uh, offspring named Kaiserling, uh, who espoused positivity after the debacle of the First World War, uh, not a mainstream uh, uh, philosopher. So he finally graduates, and you can see, he graduates at the age of 31 in 1755 from uh, the university and becomes a privat docent, so a junior lecturer, uh, where you get paid uh, by the number of people uh, who come to your lectures. And uh, he develops quite a following. Uh, his lectures are very lively, and he lectures in a variety of different subjects, not just philosophy, but geography and history, metaphysics, etc. And by all accounts, despite the fact that he was uh, uh, only less than five feet tall, very thin, thin and gaunt, uh, he was he attracted uh, large numbers of people to his lectures. It, was, it took up to 15 years for him to be appointed as Professor of Logic and Metaphysics at the University of Königsberg. And then uh, during that time, he went into sort of self-imposed isolation, really, to really uh, work out his philosophy. And uh, to this date, uh, to this day, uh, it is known that he was awoken from his dogmatic slumbers, as he calls it, by David Hume, that actually made him to question the prevailing rationalism with which he grew up, uh, to actually look at uh, British empiricism in a lot more detail. And that gave rise, after 11 years of being appointed to the professorship, to the publication of the Critique of Pure Reason, or the Critique der reinen uh, Vernunft, and then seven years later, he published the Critique of Practical Reason, the Critique of Praktischen uh, Vernunft. And finally, uh, in 1789, his other major work was the publication of Critique of Judgment. And this is really a work on aesthetics. And I'm not going to cover that today. I'm going to concentrate more on pure reason, which is his epistemology. So the way we know things about knowledge and also the practical reason is much more about his ethics and his morality. And those are the two things that uh, I will cover. And then he died in 1804. Um, age 79. So that's a very brief canter through his life and, and his family, etc. But I think it's quite useful uh, to have that as a sort of backdrop. Okay, the historic context is quite interesting. Uh, so just before his uh, birth, Frederick II is proclaimed King of Prussia. Uh, the population of East Prussia is decimated in between 1709 and 1711, over two years, but by about 33 to 50%, nearly half, mainly through war, plague, and famine. And I think uh, by the time we get into the uh, 1700s, uh, the East Prussia is that blob on the right-hand side. And this isn't a very good map because it still shows it connected to the sort of greater greater Prussia or Germany uh, as it was to become. Obviously, Germany didn't exist as a nation uh, until 1871 with Bismarck. But the point I'm trying to make here is that actually it was a bit of an offshoot, is East Prussia. It was a way, it was distant from uh, the main Prussia. And to the left of that blob on the right-hand side is, uh, was actually Poland. And the partition of Poland didn't actually happen till much later. So you had East Prussia all by itself. To the uh, west, we had Poland, which was one hour behind. And then to the, on the right of that uh, blob of uh, East Prussia on the map was Russia. And they were 11 days behind because they were working to the Julian calendar. And the whole concept of this time differential uh, future commentators believe had a big bearing in terms of uh, Immanuel Kant's uh, perception and interpretation of uh, time itself, and we come on to that a little bit uh, later on. 
And then uh, in 1771, so this is still before he uh, uh, writes his uh, critiques, East Prussia is linked to Prussia finally by an annexation of Poland by Frederick the Great. And uh, the whole thing uh, comes to a bit of a crescendo uh, just after uh, Khan's death as Napoleon wins the Battle of Jena and becomes Emperor of Germany. So the reason why I put this historic context in there, because it's, it is actually uh, something that's relevant to Kant. Kant didn't even travel through East Prussia. Kant really spent his entire life in Königsberg. And even when he was uh, tutoring uh, rich families, probably never strayed more than 20 to 30 miles from the city. So I think uh, it is quite interesting uh, for someone who's always stayed his entire life in one place, for him to develop the philosophy he did, uh, to, to tutor and lecture on subjects such as geography uh, around the world, is quite interesting for someone who's never actually experienced the world outside uh, East Prussia. And predominantly, actually, that means uh, Königsberg. Good. Okay, so the philosophical context is also very important because Kant uh, in Prussia uh, really grew up uh, with a dose of rationalism. And uh, on the right hand side, I try to sort of depict what rationalism is in its most basic format. And rationalism is a philosophy that believes that we primarily gain our understanding of the world and objects in the world through reason rather than experience. Whereas empiricism, which is the other way around, believes that it is the experiences that we encounter through objects in everyday life that provides knowledge to us. And those are the sort of uh, two uh, big divides that uh, Kant became familiar with. He grew up on rationalism, encountered uh, David Hume's empiricism and severe skepticism at the same time that really woke him up to actually consider uh, where to take philosophy uh, from then. So under rationalism, I just wanted to mention uh, the, the people involved. So uh, early on, you have René Descartes, uh, who is famous for the cogito argument. He's a rationalist, so cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am, is his thought experiment. Uh, and he came to the conclusion, the one thing he can't doubt is that he's doubting. And therefore, what was absolutely certain for him is that he exists because he can think or doubt. Uh, he is the ultimate skeptic who actually even questioned the existence of the external world. Can he really reason that the external world exists? And he felt, the only way he could progress from his own existence through reason to the outside, outside world was to actually invoke God as the surety of the external world. We come on to that a little bit later because Kant takes issue with that. The second rationalist was uh, Baruch Spinoza, uh, another rationalist who actually is famous for his uh, 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 saying Deus sive natura, which is God or nature. Uh, Baruch Spinoza was effectively a pantheist. Uh, he believed that uh, God certainly wasn't of the Abrahamic variety and was therefore excommunicated by the Jewish uh, uh, community and uh, changed his name to Benedictus Spinoza from Baruch. Uh, his philosophy is very much on the basis that God and nature are effectively synonymous with each other. It's, it's the, the one sust, substance that explains itself and doesn't, isn't explained by something else. So he believed that actually uh, God and nature are interchangeable. And the final one of the great rationalists is Gottfried Leibniz, uh, a German, and uh, he divided the world up from of rationality into two, two truths. There are truths of reasoning, things you can discover the validity of through reasoning and truths of fact. Now, truths of reasoning are absolutely true by the definition of the terms that the reasoning involves, whereas truths of fact 
are actually contingent. You need to actually go out and find whether something is the case. Uh, for example, the truth of reasoning, Andreas is male, does need no further explanation because the terms of male implies Andreas. Uh, whereas truth of fact that Andreas is now wearing blue socks is not something that we is, needs, can be established. It's contingent until we actually look as to whether Andreas is in fact wearing blue socks. Okay, so that's the rationalists. I hope that's relatively uh, clear and I'm sure we can return to it later. On the other hand, which is where Kant encountered a different philosophy which awoke him from his dogmatic slumbers was empiricism. Now there's also three people and uh, the first of which is John Locke. And John Locke was uh, born in the village of, of Rington, not far south of Bristol, so very close to all of us. And he was a thoroughgoing empiricist and his uh, uh, sort of key slogan is that uh, tabula rasa so we are a blank slate so as far as uh, John Locke is concerned we are not born with any innate faculties we are basically com a complete empty sheet of paper on which experience writes it is only through the experiences of objects in the world that we become to actually uh, gain knowledge of the world the second uh, empiricist is the is George Barclay. Uh, he's going to be, become Bishop Barclay of Cloyne. And his key uh, thought, philosophical thought, is Esse Est Pekipi. And I'm sure many of you will have heard of this. This is to be is to be perceived. So we can only, only in being, we are only real in the world by being perceived or things in the world in general only exist when they are being perceived. That's quite, that's quite a sort of uh, extreme position to take. It's, it's like the, the sort of question that you sometimes get at Oxford University entrance exams, you know. Um, you know, when, when the tree falls in Russia, does it make a sound? Uh, things like that you know th these are the kind of mind uh, games uh, that you can play now the only way that Barclay can guarantee the outside world is through God because God is there to perceive everything whether it be trees whether it be us our actions etc so the world exists because God perceives it even when we're not perceiving it God is and therefore the world exists and the final one of the empiricist who actually really uh, got uh, uh, Kant thinking is David Hume, uh, who is also uh, known as the great skeptic, whose key uh, uh, philosophical thought is custom is the great guide of human life. And uh, Hume was very skeptical about what we can actually uh, know uh, for certain about the world. Uh, he even questioned notions like cause and effect. As far as Hume is concerned, he was skeptical that we could ever prove one thing causes another. The best thing is that two things happen one after the other, but not whether one is causing the other. And I think uh, that means that we also can't be sure whether the external world really exists. And I think this is what this is the one thing that woke up Kant and says, what, after 2000 years or so, we're still in philosophical terms questioning whether the external world exists. There's all the progress being made by science and he knew Newton and he loved uh, the discoveries that Newton made and he found it ridiculous that actually philosophers are still arguing as to whether the, we can prove that the external world exists. So, I hope, I hope that gives you a quick summary sketch of uh, uh, what the milieu and the times that he found himself in. Now Kant, one of his uh, philosophical ideas uh, is reason. And he was a big proponent of the Enlightenment or the Aufklärung or the Erleuchtung, depending uh, which Enlightenment we're talking about. And uh, for Kant, 
he responded to a question uh, that was put to the uh, Enlightenment thinkers by an, a pastor called Johannes Zöllner in the late 1780s. Zöllner himself uh, in Berlin was a part of the Enlightenment and was actually part of the Wednesday Society, where Enlightenment figures met and discussed uh, the role of the Enlightenment and, and how the Enlightenment was changing, the world was being perceived. And actually, the church was increasingly taking less of an authoritarian uh, position in terms of how the world is. And the Enlightenment thinkers were beginning to think about even, even religious ceremonies as to whether they were should be the purview of the church alone. And I think the one thing that really got uh, Pastor Johannes Zöllner uh, uh, rather concerned is that the Enlightenment figures decided why should the church have a monopoly over marriage, the conducting of marriage ceremonies? Why can't this be done in other ways through civil ceremonies, the state actually organizing it, etc.? And, and Zöllner was so uh, concerned about this that he effectively deflected this away by asking the question of the Wednesday Club or the Wednesday Society and asked the question, what is enlightenment? And one year later, and many people replied to this, as you can imagine, all the enlightenment figures uh, wanted to make sure that they got their pennies worth in to respond to Johannes Zöllner's uh, question. But the most famous and probably the most comprehensive retort came from Immanuel Kant uh, a year later. And how does he describe uh, enlightenment? As far as Kant is concerned, humanity's emergence from its self-imposed immaturity. And immaturity is its own inability to use one's own reason and understanding independently. And I think this is a perfect example uh, where that could be summarized in the last bullet point at the end, Sapere Orde, which is dare to be wise, dare to think for yourself. Um, he wanted, as far as Kant is concerned, and the Enlightenment was all about getting away from preconceived, preperceived dogma, traditions, and beliefs that haven't had the critical inquiry by us as autonomous people. You know, it, if we just go along with what we have learned from a society, we're not using our own judgment to come to our own conclusions. And that is what uh, uh, Kant believed enlightenment was. So for him, it was the pursuit of inquiry through the use of reason. And for him, it was making the transition from minor to adult. Yeah, by because, because when uh, for him as a child, as a child, you are not using your autonomy, your own free will to actually make decisions. You are, you are beholden to accept existing rules, regulations, societal norms, uh, dogma, etc. And he actually believed, uh, this is Kant, that most of, of adults remain in that state of self-imposed immaturity. And you, you can hear in Kant already echoes of what future philosophers were going to uh, cover under this self-imposed immaturity. So the, the concept of the herd uh, comes uh, from Nietzsche, uh, another German philosopher, uh, who believes that humanity, you know, the vast majority of humanity are basically herd animals, just beasts of burden that carrying existing beliefs, ideas, on their backs without ever thinking for themselves. Uh, Simone de Beauvoir uh, has the concept of the subman, again, somebody who just goes along with whatever uh, uh, he encounters rather than actually ever making any decision uh, for himself or herself. And then finally, there's the concept by Martin Heidegger of das man, which is very similar. It's an entity, it's a human being that never ever really has any critical thinking 
uh, it, it just goes along with the existing norms, never strays beyond that, never questions anything, never wants to find out about how things are for himself or herself. So what that means is that for Kant, operating under one's own autonomy is very, very important. Yeah, rather than relying on the uh, wisdom of others, uh, he would he would in, encourage all of us to be curious about the world and find out about the world ourselves. Uh, he also believed that we are free to explore the world and knowledge, both in private and in public. Uh, so by freedom, he means we have the ability uh, to make choices. We could do otherwise. Because otherwise, uh, if we can't do otherwise, effectively, things like ethics and uh, morality are, are, are effectively uh, mute terms. And the way he summarized all of this is sapere ode, Latin, for uh, dare to be wise, dare to know, uh, find out yourself, be curious, both in terms of acquiring knowledge, uh, your thought processes, your behaviors, and your deeds. So that's the first of the, the big uh, responses to uh, what is enlightenment. Okay. Um, now, uh, another big idea in Kant is that the way he sees uh, time and space and the external world. Now, as I already alluded to earlier, Kant thought it was absolutely ridiculous that philosophers could question the notion of is there time and is there space uh, out there in the external world. He thought it was a travesty that it's taken philosophy all this time never to come to a conclusion and uh, he wanted to uh, give it a crack and he defined time very simply. For something to exist it must be determinable in time and also determine in time when it came into being and how long it existed for. Now, what he discovered is that consciousness is very different. In our own consciousness, we don't experience time passing as such. We're just exp experiencing the eternal present, the eternal now. Every time I think of something in my consciousness, it's of now. For example, I'm looking at the watch, I'm thinking that's in my consciousness. The next minute I'm looking at the slide below or the picture below of Regensburg, for example. But my conscious state changes all the time. So as far as Kant is concerned, uh, we don't in our own consciousness experience the passing of time. The only way we do that is by actually in relation to things that move and change. And these things are outside of us. So, for example, using the watch example there, seeing the hands move themselves does not give us any uh, notion of time unless we actually have the concept of the numbers against which the dials change to give us time. So time and uh, space actually make the external world possible. So time and space are like immov immovable goggles that we are born with. They're intuitions of our mind. They already exist uh, when we come to the world. They're not something that we get from experience. They're, they're pure intuitions. So both time and space are prior intuitions through which we experience the external world. And uh, space and time are the necessary givens so, you know, without, without those intuitions in our capacity as a human being or as a mammal, in this case, we would not be able to have uh, experiences of the world. And I think that is a key facet for Kant, because what he's actually saying is that, that uh, we can be very certain of the external world, we can also be certain of uh, a uh, of time moving on, but we can only do that from our own human intuition. That doesn't mean necessarily that the world as it is is actually in time or in space. 
And I'll come on to that in a second. So the phenomenal world is what we inhabit. And as far as Kant is concerned, we can never learn more about the world than the phenomenal world. Die, die Welt an sich is nicht, kennen wir nicht. So the world in itself is, is not knowable of us. The world of appearance, the phenomenal world, however, is because of the faculties and the capacities that we have, the reason we have, uh, the, the logical uh, uh, ability to, to experience the world, from a human point of view, we can assess as being certain. But that doesn't mean that the world as it really is outside our mental and physical faculties as humans is actually the way we perceive it. So for Kant, the scope of human knowledge is limited by human capacities. Uh, and I think to some extent, you know, that's a, that's a precursor of, of some of the uh, Darwinian thought and the uh, uh, genetics to follow that clearly, uh, you know, we have certain capabilities that gives us certain possibilities uh, of knowledge, but doesn't mean that it exhausts all possible knowledge that, uh, of everything that is out there in the universe. And then things like, so I mentioned earlier, time, space, even cause and effect, and the categories uh, such as quality, quantity, relations, and modality are the way we are able to experience the phenomenal world. Because once you've got time and space defined by, as Kant did, in terms of a pure intuition, in terms of how we can see the world, then also other things become very strange. So quality, you know, we, quantity is already something that is inherent in us. And actually, because time and space are linked, we see relations in the world, and we see also see change. The only reason why we see change is because of the relation of things in, in comparison to us. So it's a very, very uh, transcendental way of, of looking at reality. The world in itself, die Welt an sich, is completely unknowable to us and may not exhibit these uh, uh, prior, prior, a priori intuitions, such as time and space, or the categories like relations, cause and effect, modality, etc. That's just the way we as humans perceive the world. Now, the only, the, that helps him to avoid the skepticism in the phenomenal world without reducing metaphysics to uh, ashes as Hume has done. For Hume had a very simple uh, test as to whether something is valid. If it can be established by reason or it can be established by fact, then it has validity. Anything else, mere speculation about things outside reason and fact, such as the existence of God, any metaphysics, etc., is completely irrelevant and adds nothing. And I think in his terms, in Hume's terms, that is, should be uh, consigned to the fire. Uh, and that's why people talk about uh, metaphysics being reduced to ashes by Hume. And... Uh, being resurrected by Kant, like the phoenix rising from the ashes by splitting the world into the phenomenal human world and the numeral world as it is. Okay. How are we doing for time? No, I think we're okay. Um, the other thing that uh, uh, Kant took very seriously are things, how we gain knowledge. And there's two different uh, propositions that he uh, looked at. And uh, this is not just Kant, this is philosophers in general. There are analytic propositions, and analytic propositions are a proposition whose predicate concept is contained in its subject concept. Well, I mean, that's the sort of dictionary definition. But uh, basically, uh, it adds nothing new. It should be self-explanatory and self-contained. So for example, all bachelors are unmarried men, is an analytic proposition. It is true by the very nature of the words in the proposition and by the terms being used. You don't need any, you don't need to go out into the world to actually establish whether all bachelors are unmarried because the very definition of an unmarried man is a bachelor. Uh, on the other hand, and these are necessarily true. So these are necessary propositions. Uh, for, the, for them to be true, whereas synthetic propositions are contingent. Uh, they are propositions whose predicate concept is not contained 
in a subject concept, but is related. So for example, uh, Andreas is uh, 55 years old, is a synthetic statement uh, because somebody would need to find out whether that's the case by looking at my birth certificate, for example. So these, these are not uh, synonymous with each other. And the synthetic proposition therefore says something new about the world to be explored. It is not contained in the proposition itself. So that's the distinction between analytic and synthetic proposition. The reason why that's important is because we come next to the another differentiation between a priori propositions, things you can know without experience, and a posteriori statements, which you can only understand after uh, experiencing them in the first place, and then Kant does something with that. Okay, so we've talked about uh, analytic and synthetic propositions, uh, a priori and a posteriori knowledge. So a, pri a priori knowledge is that which is independent from experience. And you find that in things, concepts like mathematics, tautologies, you know, it is or it isn't, for example, and mental deductions through the use of reason. A posteriori knowledge, on the other hand, uh, requires experimental and empirical evidence, such as observations, scientific tests, hypotheses, uh, and or personal experiences. Now, Kant asked himself the question, is it possible to have a synth synthetic a priori? So something that isn't defined by the terms itself, it's not related, it's something new to be explored, but it actually exists prior to experience. And uh, he felt, yes, it is. And uh, as far as he is concerned, there is such a thing as a synthetic a priori. And these priori uh, intuitions and concepts such as space, time, causality, quantity, relations, and modality give rise to the synthetic a priori knowledge by reason in the form of logic, mathematics, physics, and even metaphysical concepts such as morality, which we come on to in, in just a little while. So these are not things that are defined uh, by the terms themselves, but actually something that we can learn about the world, uh, you know, by actually taking ma basic mathematical axioms and actually developing whole uh, models of the universe, for example, on this, on this basis. So they're speculative, they're not just given. Okay. Okay, we've just to sort of summarize all of this in terms of his philosophical uh, ideas regarding knowledge or epistemology. Uh, on the top one here, you have got the rationalist who believes that we uh, can develop uh, knowledge of the world uh, and objects in the world through using our reason primarily. The empiricists go the other way, it's objects in the world that give us the experience from which we derive knowledge. And the third one at the bottom, I suppose, is Kant's way of looking at it. He's actually trying to synthesize both the rationalism and empiricism. So effectively what he's saying is it's neither uh, either or, it's effectively both. It is actually an ongoing process where we bring certain things to experience, like our intuition of space and time, certain concepts like quantity, substance, etc. And uh, we, from that, we derive uh, uh, the objects in experience, which provides knowledge for us. So that's a very quick one. I've, I've done another sort of sketch, which explains it in a little bit more detail. And I hope you can see that. The, the top bars are empirical knowledge and the, uh, the bottom bars are a pro knowledge. So what, what we bring to the party, so to speak, as human beings before experiencing anything specific are uh, the intuition of space and time. So we've talked about that. And we also bring with it general concepts that we form, things like substance. And uh, so that's the a priori knowledge that we bring to the party. And what, what we receive from the objects that we perceive in the world we get the idea of a specific item, such as a book, and the intuition of a particular book. We actually experience the book, a specific book. And that's something that is uh, done through experience. So what Kant is basically saying, this whole thing 
isn't shouldn't be an argument between the rationalists and the empiricists as to which way knowledge flows it is actually an ongoing process where we start off with our core intuitions of space and time and the sort of core concepts of categories from which we experience particular objects in the world from which we form concepts in our mind and that will be the starting point the basis of our future experiences in the world. Now I hope that's clear. I'm sure we can discuss that uh, later on. Uh, I mean the good news is that uh, uh, this presentation will be on the uh, BLSI YouTube channel in four weeks time so you can always go back and, and uh, familiarize yourself with it. Okay so this so far has been all Kant's idea around epistemology or how we know what we know. Uh, his, his ethics uh, uh, are also very important because they're still with us today. I think Kant would have been a proponent of deontology. Uh, deontology is the belief, a moral belief, that our uh, motivations and intentions and our considerations, this is on the right hand slide here, and actions are, are fundamentally important to our ethics and morality not just the outcomes they produce. Whereas a consequentialist would argue that actually what defines the right and wrong of a particular action is driven by the outcome that it produces. Now, uh, we come on to that, we, I'll tackle that in a second. As far as Kant was concerned, he, like, like we can discover through reason that the external world and time exist, uh, he believes that we can use our human reason to also come up and, and be certain about our morality and ethics. And uh, that's, that's very different to uh, potentially many other philosophers, so utilitarianism under Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, even, even David Hume uh, and his distinction between ought and, and is. Uh, is very different to Kant. So Kant thought we can come to uh, morality through reasons. Uh, he believes in order for ethics to exist, we, uh, we, are, we need to be uh, of the belief, of the opinion, or of the reason that we have freedom to act. We could do otherwise. Uh, otherwise, if we can't do otherwise, then really there is no uh, ethical, moral, uh, question to be answered. Uh, but the morality or morality is all about uh, fulfilling one own autonomy, which we discussed earlier in terms of sapere order. You know, you need to take charge of your own life in order to be able to lead a moral or ethical life. And morality is based on treating oneself and others as an end rather than purely as a means to an end. So I think that's important because I think, you know, the, the, uh, the consequentialist attitude would be, or is portrayed often as the end justifies the means, which again for Kant is, 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 uh, is not the case. You need to actually take into consideration in terms of your moral outlook, your moral behavior, not just uh, the outcomes, but the motivations, intentions, and so on that lead to your actions and the outcomes it produces. And that's why he calls it the Copernican revolution. You know, uh, as far uh, as uh, knowledge is concerned, his Copernican revolution, so he calls it the Copernican revolution because Copernicus obviously moved the worldview from a terra-centric to a heliocentric universe. And, and Kant is, thinks he's doing the same in epistemology, in knowledge, because uh, experience needs to conform to our innate intuitions and uh, of knowledge rather than the other way around. And he's doing the same in terms of ethics. You know, uh, our ethics uh, needs to apply, uh, our actions and outcomes need to, need to uh, uh, be subservient to some extent to the motivations and the intentions that lead to the actions that we make. What he's effectively trying to do is again, synthesizing deontology and consequentialism. He doesn't believe that outcomes aren't important, but what he's saying is you cannot have a moral theory, an ethical uh, doctrine that misses out 
uh, all the prevailing uh, preceding elements of moral decisions, such as motivations, intentions, considerations, and the actions to which it leads. Because you would never uh, uh, come up with a moral foundation for the outcomes or the consequences of your actions. Um, morality also is not derived from dogma and precepts. Unless you take charge of your own morality uh, and uh, ethics, uh, you are not behaving in a moral way. So if you are only behaving uh, according to God's commandments, the Ten Commandments, for example, rather than uh, and take that as dogma, dogma and take it as a as a as a thou shalt and thou shalt not, and uh, not because of your own thoughts on the matter, then that doesn't count as morality for Kant. Uh, and it's an ongoing process rather than the state of affairs. I think that's very important. Ethics and morality aren't states of affairs or simply uh, states of being for Kant they're an ongoing and unfolding uh, process okay okay so the way he expresses this and I'm just sort of looking at the time again yeah we've got I think just about that time the category imperative so as Kant came up with the categories of the mind, as far as knowledge is concerned, you know, we talked about time and space, we talked about causality and uh, quantity and relations and modality and things like that. He does that similar thing with uh, morality, uh, but he only comes up with one key categorical imperative. And uh, that has got three formulations. So I'll very briefly go through this. Uh, and it all stems from something that uh, he got uh, from his mother as a child. But this quote at the top is probably one of the famous quotes of Kant, which was, was probably uh, concocted when he was in his 50s, so much later on. And it is, the heavenly stars above me and the moral law within me fill the mind with ever new and increasing admiration and awe the more often and steadily we refl reflect upon them. And I think that's important because the heavenly, heavenly stars is effectively his uh, belief in, in astronomy and physics, especially after Newton and the laws of motion and gravity, for example. So he was a very key proponent of, of science. And uh, he believes the moral law within him is just as certain as it is uh, as the laws of nature. So the, the formulations of the categorical imperative are three. There's the moral uh, formulation, which goes, act only according to that maxim, where you can, whereby you can, at the same time, will that it should be become a universal law. So act only by the maxim, so by the principle, that you could at the same time wish would become a universal law if everybody else did the same thing. So, for example, uh, an example of this would be uh, lying, telling a lie would be inconsistent with that, because if, if you could want uh, lying to become a universal law, that would mean that everybody would be lying and everybody would know that everybody else is lying and therefore lying in itself has, is, is contradictory. Because everybody would be like, nobody would believe anybody. Whereas always telling the truth does have value in itself. It's not self contradictory. Because everybody uh, telling the truth means that everybody is actually uh, assured of, of other people's behavior. The second uh, uh, formulation is the human formulation. And we talked about that a little bit early on. Act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, never merely as a means to an end, but always at the same time as an end in itself. So treat people like as people rather than as tools uh, for a particular uh, uh, means is basically. So, you, you know, you, even, you know, and I think the, the famous uh, quote is probably from Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre, and he uses these sort of, uh, example of a waiter in a French cafe not being a uh, authentic because he's not being himself he's just playing the role of a waiter so what uh, what Kant would be saying is you know treat people as themselves 
uh, and treat them with respect rather than just treat them as a means to an end for yourself. And then the final uh, category as uh, so the um, formulation is the autonomy formulation. And that is the idea of the will of every rational being as a university legislating will. So effectively using our autonomy to uh, behave in a way that uh, uh, takes society forward as a whole. And Kant finishes this off. And the, you know, we talked about, we only know the phenomenal world. We never see das Ding an sich or the thing in itself. Well, he makes one exception. And as far as Kant is concerned, the only thing that is real in the world that we can now beyond our own human world is that a good will is a thing in itself. It has no contradiction. It has no further need for itself. It is just good. And therefore goodness is an unmedi unmediated essence for goodness's sake. And that is effectively his uh, overall ethics. I hope that's uh, useful. I just want to finish off uh, just to cover his legacy. As I said in the, uh, the blurb uh, for this talk, uh, Kant is widely seen as the most philosopher, most important modern philosopher of the Western uh, uh, age uh, and uh, also of the modern age. Uh, he influenced a vast canon of subsequent philosophers, and I'm going to mention a few here, but literally it is very difficult to think of any philosopher uh, post-Kant that didn't uh, react to Kant or had Kantian thoughts in, in their philosophy. And that is certainly true for both the analytic philosophy, which was mainly in the sort of Anglo-Saxon world. So we're talking here in the UK and in America. And these are modern philosophers like Quine and people like that. Uh, Daniel Dennett uh, would be analytic philosophers uh, who look at the power of reason, of analytical rigor to see whether things are valid or not. So the uh, philosophy of language, for example. And then there's the continental philosophy, uh, which are things like uh, Heidegger, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, uh, Merleau-Ponty, uh, lots of uh, other Deleuze, uh, Gilles Deleuze, etc., who are actually much more interested not in the practical uh, and rigorous application of reason to, to test validity, but much more interested in the individual in terms of what it means to be a human being, which basically is the phenomenal world that can set up. Whereas analytic philosophy is more looking at the analytical <clears throat> validity of language, logic, etc. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so Hegel is, is an immediate um, influence. In fact, Hegel and his phenomenology of spirit is focusing on uh, the world, the world spirit unfolding itself in time, uh, moving forwards through a dialectic method of uh, a, th a uh, thesis, uh, which is, is opposed by an antithesis and is united uh, th through a synthesis. It's quite interesting, actually, 1807 was actually uh, the year uh, uh, after uh, the Battle of Jena. And uh, Hegel actually uh, had to escape Jena with a manuscript of the phenomenology of spirit in his pocket, which must have been a big pocket because I think the phenomenology of spirit is of a similar size to uh, Kant's uh, critique of pure reason, some 800 pages. Uh, Schopenhauer also uh, took uh, Kant as his basis, uh, and especially in his major magnum opus, uh, The World as Will, as Will and Representation, where effectively the will, the world exists only as a, as a will, a blind will of, to life, and uh, which consumes everything and represents uh, manifestations of itself uh, to us. But it is all about craving. It's quite a sort of uh, uh, Eastern thought of Hinduism and, and Buddhism. Now Nietzsche, uh, uh, famously in gay science, but also in uh, Thus Spake Zarathustra. Oh, thank you, Sally. She's bringing me a glass of water. So I'm coughing a bit. So just one second. 
Yeah, so Nietzsche in in Gay Science, a famous book of his, and also in Thus Spake uh, Zarathustra, um, effectively uh, killed off God. He actually says God is dead and we have killed him. Uh, Kant actually makes room for God in the noumenal world of which we can't know anything. As far as uh, Nietzsche is concerned in the in the 1880s, we've uh, the Enlightenment has actually put put a, a dagger uh, through God, and uh, the belief in God is no longer valid uh, for us, and therefore absolute ethics, absolute morality has gone out of the window, and we are now an anxious humanity trying to make sense of what the world can be like in ethical and moral terms without having absolute uh, uh, strictures imposed by God. So Nietzsche wasn't a nihilist in that way. He actually saw the loss of all values and all values devaluing themselves as a, as a big shame. He actually felt that it's now up to us to make our own rules, our own uh, morals and ethics. But he recognized that we are actually quite an anxious species trying to do that. Uh, Wittgenstein and the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus is probably one of the most dense philosophical works you can ever see. It's only about 75 pages long. And that's in the, very much in the analytic tradition. It is all about the analysis of, of uh, language and potentially the reduction of language uh, to logic, to really understand whether terms and the, the terms we use are valid arguments. Uh, this carried on with the Vienna Circle and the birth of logical positivism. And you had people like Carnap and Otto Neurath, uh, people like that, and, and Moritz Schlick in that thing. And they, they took uh, on Wittgenstein's uh, thought uh, very much so in terms of can we test language and is language being used properly? Do sentences, are sentences properly structured and do they say something that they shouldn't? Uh, that's the analytic tradition. 1927, Heidegger publishes his famous book, Being and Time. We're going back much more into ontology and what it's like to be a human being, which is followed by Sartre in 1943 by publishing Being and Nothingness. Again, what is life like uh, as a human being? Uh, what is consciousness? Uh, and uh, he divides the world up into effectively our facticity, i.e. the world that we are thrown into, and the potential uh, that uh, lies latent within us in terms of what we make of it. And uh, he believes that uh, nothingness and consciousness is absolute freedom, uh, you know, no restrictions in terms of how we fulfill ourselves as human beings. And then finally, in 1953, we've got the posthumous publication of Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations, where he effectively retracts everything he said in the Tractatus. Uh, language is no longer something to be analyzed for its uh, logical consistency, but it is actually something to be regarded as uh, valid for it, the use that is made of language, how it relates to things and people in the world, rather than its logical structure. So all of these people have been influenced by Kant, and they split into two areas, more the analytical side, and then the continental side. Uh, the former, much more about logical rigor, the other one, much more about existential uh, questions around existence and the individual. So as you can see, Immanuel Kant, he was a towering figure of the Enlightenment. He was an towering, a towering figure of modern philosophy and his legacy, both in his epistemology, i.e. knowledge, our uh, state of knowledge, and also our ethics and morality is with us to this day. So I now say thank you very much and vielen Dank, and uh, I should look forward to copious questions. Well, Andreas, thank you very much for that uh, very stimulating talk. I'm sure you've given us an awful lot to think about there. Um, we do already have one question. Uh, does John B. want to put it himself? Do you want to unmute yourself or do you want to, me to read it out? Oh, yeah, I'll put it. Um, so 
goodness exists as something in itself. Um, so I was just wondering if he ever said anything about the idea of evil as something in itself. I just got this sort of post-Kantian movement towards something that eventually produces Hitler in my mind. But um, yeah. uh, did he uh, did he think beyond goodness into what that implies about other actions? Yeah, uh, well, it's not clear from his philosophy, uh, John, but I think uh, uh, if you took his philosophy to its natural conclusion, uh, he would probably, and I'm paraphrasing now, and, uh, and Kant is probably turning in his grave in Kalingrad Cathedral right now. But uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, goodness uh, has, has now contradiction in itself. Whereas... Uh, evil does because if evil or murder existed uh, as a universal law then humanity wouldn't be possible it would literally be a Hobbes's state of nature which is short brutish nasty and uh, and so on so I think he hasn't explicitly uh, explored uh, evil but he would have seen contradictions in evil that he wouldn't have seen in goodness Okay. Uh, John, Thank you. That answers your question. <laughs> um, does anybody else have any comments or questions? If so, can you put your hand up and I'll, uh, I've got two pages of people to look at here. So I'll have to um, zip through. Is there anybody, or are you all blinded by science um, or philosophy? I can't see anybody. Well, I mean, you know, I, I'm 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 happy happy to uh, carry on until about nine o'clock if people want to. But I mean, uh, the main thing really, the thrust is, I'm happy to share the slides, for example, with the group, and send those on uh, because I think waiting. Uh, Duncan is going to ask a question just before you do, Duncan. Uh, uh, I'm happy to share the slides uh, because I think, uh, you know, that might help. Who, people who on this call who want to sort of dig a bit deeper. Uh, so I can do that. And then obviously the lecture will be on video uh, at the, in about four weeks time. But Duncan, over to you. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, you're saying a lot about Wittgenstein that really isn't quite accurate. Wittgenstein didn't actually read very much Kant, if you read any of it. The only thing that he was concerned with was a thing called incongruous incongruous counterparts. And this is that it, it must be a synthetic a priori truth that a right hand glove, right, cannot yeah. at the same time be made to coincide with a left hand glove. Yeah. So this whole idea of something that in experience, right, um, exists at one level and theoretically exists at another, with the very foundation of Kantian philosophy was the thing that Wittgenstein was attacking. Yeah. What he said is that the right hand and the left hand, this by the way is Tractatus 636 111, the right hand and the left hand are completely congruent. It's quite irrelevant that they cannot be made to coincide. Yeah. A right hand glove could be put on the left hand if it could be turned around in four dimensional space. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I, so, I, so basically, the whole pillar on which Kant stands really is something that Wittgenstein, rightly or wrongly, completely attacked. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, yeah, I don't want to give the impression that uh, all subsequent philosophers to Kant just thought he'd solved philosophy and they agreed with him. I actually think what I'm saying is a lot of most philosophers after Kant reacted to Kant, either in terms of saying, well, actually, I mean, even to the extent Schopenhauer, you know, who was uh, and, and Hegel, they were reacting quite quickly after after a count and they, you know they didn't understand uh, or they didn't feel it necessary for the world to be sp split into two the phenomenal world and and the numeral world you know as far as they were concerned there's only one world and uh, you know that's either the world spirit and un unfolding itself through history for Hegel or it's this blind universal will uh, so they don't they already took umbrage with Kant. Likewise, Kant uh, and Wittgenstein would have done the same in the Tractatus. I would have thought Wittgenstein 
in uh, the philosophical investigations, it's probably not quite as scathing of Kant uh, there. Maybe he's further away, actually. Okay, well, I mean, we, we'll, we'll have to have a subsequent discussion, Duncan, about the philosophy. Yes, okay, no, but thank you very much for your answer and your, your excellent exposition of Kant. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank Good. You. Is there, are, are there any more? Ah, Philippa. Oh, oh no, Philippa's applauding. Um, thank you. There are a couple of um, appreciations mm -hmm. in the chat as well. I can't see anybody else wishing to raise a point. Um, John Edison's got his thumb up. Um, oh, no, I beg your pardon, Philippa does want to say something. Um, well, I did have something I wanted, golly, I seem to be rather dark. I did have something I wanted to um, comment on, but actually before that, I think Dipali had also had her hand up. Oh, I beg your pardon, Dipali, I hadn't seen that. Do you want to say, do you want to ask your question, Dipali? Oh, hello, sorry. <clears throat> I did have my hand up and then I thought about it and I thought I shouldn't bore other people. But uh, what came across to me in terms of um, uh, the um, sort of uh, interpretation of Kant's philosophy by um, Andreas was that he was encouraging people to be individualists. And in our society, uh, that doesn't work. So the society is an evolving thing. Perception is evolving. Morality is evolving based on how we are evolving. For example, things that were considered correct and right 100 years ago now are being questioned and are being overturned. So it is a, uh, it is a what do you call it, uh, evolution. Uh, morality is, is, is evolving with uh, new truths coming in. And these truths are actually observations of how interactions have taken place because society is getting more complex and as society is developing in complexity the interaction patterns are also developing and therefore morality is evolving yeah. how do you how do you gauge how do you swim in this interaction of you know interaction patterns of that are that are now evolving from people's behavior so it is an evolving situation, but to throw uh, this thing into the midst of um, being an individual and questioning norms, and I, I think the whole thing is sort of uh, quite, quite a, quite a um, interesting uh, thing to look into, yeah. because no, um, it is. Yeah. I mean, I think from for just to answer your question, I suppose is uh, Kant didn't really see us as individualists. I think he, what he had in mind is we needed to, we sh he encouraged us to think for ourselves and also act in a way that actually relates uh, to others in a way that everybody would want to agree to. So uh, th what he's effectively saying under the uh, uh, the moral uh, uh, categorical imperative is, is never treat others and yourself as a as a as a means to an end. Always treat others and yourself as an end in itself. So uh, he's trying to sort of come up with something that everybody could agree to. Is you know a society can progress, move forward by actually having a framework that that evaluates whether an action is something that would be deemed by moral would be deemed as moral or not and this is a process i, I agree with you dipali and i think kant would have also seen that, that actually you move forward by by uh, adopting customs traditions uh, laws etc and you move forward from that but you should continue to critically assess the validity of these things, because as far as uh, Kant would be concerned, is uh, you can't just take things as always progressing in a positive manner. And as the as the times and the era and the traditions change, we should constantly still question whether the the current framework of our society, the way we see the world, and uh, from a moral perspective, are actually still valid. So yeah, I mean, coming from the background that I come from, the questioning, the yoga, the awareness is a thing you live with all the time yeah. because you're constantly uh, becoming aware of not just the external world, 
but also the internal world, you know, the world within you. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, everything that Kant put forward is something that we do culturally, yeah. uh, where I come from anyway. So it makes a lot of sense. But um, yeah, I mean, society is growing in complexity and I agree with you entirely with your interpretation, Andreas, that uh, it is an evolving process, morality. Okay, thank you. Philippa. Philippa. I think you wanted to, oh, I'm still muted. No, I'm not. No. Philippa, you wanted to say something. Thank you. Yes, um, this might be rather um, the opposite of erudite, but I did want to say that I felt very f encouraged as a human being by a slide which was about three back into the presentation and it was the one about the ethical system where it um, recognized the validity of intentions as well as outcomes and I thought that was something that I could sort of quite align with but I do wonder whether you think that the systems we impose on ourselves actually do align with that. Do you think our legal system and our sort of system of employment tribunals on things take account of intentions or do they just take account of outcomes? Because it does, it do, it does actually sort of matter, doesn't it, what your ethical system is to how you actually define the rules by which you live? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that's why, that's why Kant was really trying to come up with a not the content of morality but a framework for morality that wasn't contingent on a particular time in history you know as far as he was concerned is things will always change you know the laws will change and they will fit a certain uh, uh, certain era uh, some of them will be more draconian because the the times demanded, you know, sometimes our freedom of movement needs to be restricted because there's a global pandemic, those kind of things. Uh, but the underlying reason why these things are done to Kant need to be sound. Yeah, so, you know, the motivation of saying stay at home uh, can't just be stay at home because a politician feels like it. There needs to be a, a, a good will at work to prevent or in this case, in the pandemic, to prevent something happening. Uh, so I think that would be... Uh, so he's not trying to give a moral content of our uh, actions and our ethics. He's trying to provide a framework on which we can evaluate whether uh, something is moral or not. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've got another question from John Edison. Do you want to ask your question, John? Are you still with us? Or have you gone? I can't see you on the list of names. Oh, yes, you're there. Oh, no, it's disappeared again. Uh, oh, you're there. Yes. No, I'm still here. Yes. Would you like to ask your question, John? Yeah. Yes, as it says there on the chat, was Kant influenced by earlier studies such as those of Aquinas and uh, medieval theologians? Well, that, that, is, that is really interesting. That's a really interesting question because it isn't clear uh, from his philosophy. I think the, the one thing I would say is it's, it's quite interesting. Kant is notoriously difficult to pigeonhole. So, you know, you've got philosophers uh, and, and people commenting to this day who thought some think he's an atheist, some people thought he was an agnostic, other ones he's a thoroughgoing theist. From, so reading his uh, philosophy, uh, you can basically pick and choose whichever one is your bent of your own personal opinion. Um, but I think... Uh, my personal reading of Kant would be that he is leaving room for God. Yeah, so I, I would classify more of as agnostic. He leaves room for God in the noumenal world for, in which we really cannot comprehend. But he does take umbrage 
with uh, proofs of God's existence. Yeah, so he would he would he he would have cut Aquinas and Ansel, Anselm and and all the others uh, to shreds in terms of their cosmological and ontological arguments for for God, because they, they he would have seen them as pure human constructions. Uh, rather than uh, a valid argument for the existence of God. For, for Kant, definitely God, uh, he, he wanted to believe in God because, uh, you know, the, the concept of a God, I don't think he would have believed in God of, of the Abrahamic faith. I think he would have believed God much more alongside uh, Spinoza and potentially uh, uh, Leibniz. Uh, you know, as a, as a force of nature, uh, rather than, uh, you know, a white bearded man up in the clouds. And, uh, but he did, he did leave room for God in his philosophy, uh, but he wouldn't have uh, appreciated, and he actually spent some time as part of his uh, 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 professorship dismantling sort of uh, uh, scholastic proofs of the existence of God. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mike Snelling, do you want to make your comment or, or do you want to, um, is it just as it stands? I can't, I can't see you on the No, I, 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 I think that it stands, uh, you know, interestingly they are, they could not be the base of a legal system because nobody knows what people's intentions are, probably least of all the person themselves. Um, and you can't imagine a law court digging back for intentions in any legal system. It has to deal, unfortunately, with consequences. Yeah. So, yeah. No, no, no. And I think I think that's that's fair. I think what Kant would say is that uh, uh, you need to understand the process. You know that slide I showed with the sort of circle from, you know, you you start off in a given situation. Uh, and that given situation gives rise to certain motivations and intentions in terms of how to act next. Uh, that gives rise to considerations of evaluating alternatives. You take action, which lead to certain uh, consequences, outcomes, and therefore a new situation. Now, as far as Kant is concerned, you cannot just focus on the, the end in itself. Uh, you do need to understand... Uh, uh, the motivations that lead people to that. Whether you can legislate for that in terms of uh, is another matter. I mean, he was talking much more on, of a framework, a, a ethical framework on which to assess oneself rather than uh, states of affairs like a particular uh, outcome. So I think that's important to me. We should ask ourselves not just uh, what actions gave rise to what we did, but the consequences, but also what was behind all of this, because that's equally as important. Because if my motivations are of doing something are uh, of one ilk and they're very negative, that already that already uh, discounts and 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 basically makes impossible certain actions. Yeah, it already limits the potential of what I might be actually doing by the mindset and the intentions and the motivations that mot uh, that motivate me to do these things. Yeah, I'm already limiting what I am able to do and for what reason. So I think it's really important. In a law court, you have to establish, did this happen? Did that not happen? But I think at a, at a personal level and at a human level, we need to ask ourselves the questions much more early on. Am I doing this for what I believe to be the right reasons? Are my, are my intentions already limiting me in terms of what is the art of the possible? And therefore, the, the potential of my actions is, is already heading in one direction. And I think that's what Kant is saying. It's, it's not just as simple as just focusing on the outcomes. You know, it's like, it's like, a, it's like a company. You know, I, I, you know, I used to be a business consultant. And if a company... Uh, only ever focuses on its outcome. So let's say a company is only interested in optimizing its profit and driving its market share. That is the objective, right? That's its intention. It would do more or less anything. It could do anything to deliver that outcome. It could suck half its staff. It could, it could produce uh, products 
to, specifically only to make profit rather than the quality of the products. And I think that's what Kant is saying is, look, you're already limiting yourself uh, and you're doing these things that wouldn't be consistent with what really you want to achieve. A company really wants to uh, produce good products that people actually demand and like, and, and therefore the outcome would be profit. But the means of getting to that out, outcome would be productive, positive steps in society. And I think Kant would say, by just focusing on the outcome, you are missing a great deal and you're limiting yourself in terms of what you could actually do. The whole thing is a process rather than a state of affairs. Thank you. Um, Axel, you would like to ask a question, I think. And this may need to be one of the very last ones. I, I see we've got a couple of others, but let's have Axel see how that goes. Right. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, many thanks, Andreas. So this may take you in a completely different direction, but I'm particularly interested in environmental aesthetics. Yeah. And Gernot Puma has written a lot about Kant. And I'd be really interested just to hear a little bit about Kant's aesthetics. Uh, well, the Kant's aesthetics is in the critique of, uh, of judgment. And again, uh, as far as making judgments are concerned, is uh, the importance of, of coming to aesthetic judgments. You need to, again, look at the whole, whole uh, process. It isn't just, uh, you know, so for example, how we act in the world to Kant is important. So from, a, from an ethical environmental point of view is we should not regard, we should not regard the world as a means to an end. And I think this is what was further built on by Heidegger much more. Uh, you know, we shouldn't regard the world as something to be exploited only. We should realize that the world is something in itself that actually is part of the, that provides the biosphere in which we live. And actually, you know, we, we should understand that we are part of that biosphere and act accordingly. Um, we've got perhaps uh, Robert Philpot. Um, you've got half a, a a comment in the chat. Was, was that intentional, or, or is there something you want to say, or not? <laughs> Are you still there? I, I have a I have a question, I suppose, to the audience, and that oh, is go, go on, then. <laughs> my my question would it has my talk done anything? at all to clarify uh, Kant's philosophy a little bit more and has it engendered further food for thought? Uh, I think the way that, yes, the, uh, there are some reaction buttons. Um, perhaps you'd like to put your thumbs up um, if you think that that's uh, engendered uh, food for thought. Well, I, I see the thumbs going up. That's very nice. Thank you very much for your kindness. That's very much appreciated. As I said, I think what I will do uh, uh, is send the presentation to Philippa. And then, Philippa, you can send it out to the group, uh, because otherwise you will have to wait four weeks or so before uh, it's on the YouTube channel. So I'll send the slides out, and, and, and please feel free uh, to, to have a, another sort of think about it, because... Uh, you know, that's what philosophy is all about. It's the, it's the love of wisdom. It's not about sort of deep analysis. It's a, it's a, for me, it's much more about a, a way of life, you know, how you approach life. And I think uh, that's why it would be great if it's made a difference to, to some of the people on the call today. Yes. Well, thank you for that offer. Um, I think uh, just before we give a, a virtual round of applause, I just want to um, thank uh, Andreas, again, on your behalf and my behalf uh, for a very stimulating talk. Lots, thank you also, audience, for all your questions and comments. And I know there are a couple that we haven't been able to get round to. So, um, well, maybe we'll have to invite him back again sometime. I just want to do also a quick um, advert for the German group's next um, talk, which will be given by Dr. Stefan Davis from uh, the University of Brest Bristol, 
he'll be talking on literary exiles. So um, if that topic interests you, we'd be very happy to welcome you to our next talk, which is on the 17th of May. It's a Monday. We usually uh, meet on a Thursday, but that one will be a Monday. And um, yeah, so thank you very much. And um, I was going to do something else, wasn't I? What was the other thing I've just forgotten? <laughs> That was it. I think I was just going to thank you all for coming. Oh, the round of applause. Thank you, Philippa. So um, we, we can do that either uh, virtually with, with the little icons or you, you can turn your cameras on and make it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for coming and thank you everyone for um, being here. Safe journey home. <laughs> thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you Thank so you. much, Andreas. Thank you. Pleasure. I'm fond of camp now. <laughs> I might be the host. Oh. Yes. <laughs>